we heard this, it's only redistribution. I actually heard, it's reparations. It's reparations. Right? The school teacher said redistribution. But um, on Monday, Black Lives Matter held a rally, a demonstration in Chicago. No violence this time, just a demonstration. But what were they demonstrating? They were demonstrating for the release of the 100 looters that had been arrested. They should have arrested thousands of looters, but they arrested 100 looters, the police did. And they were demonstrating to have them released. Now let's be clear about Black Lives Matter. This is not an organization that is pro, that is, sorry, anti-police brutality. This has nothing to do with equality before the law for people of different colors. This has nothing to do with justice in any rational sense. Black Lives Matter is a front for nihilism. It's a front for, for economic Marxism, for socialism of all its different varieties, but really for egalitarianism. It is a front for breaking the law, destroying property, smashing stuff. And then these guys go in and again, just like those intellectuals I talk about, and justify it and give it credibility and pretend that it's all, all cool. Again, Black Lives Matter revealing itself for what it is. They want the 100 released. And they said, why is everybody making a big deal out of looting? It's just a head start on reparations. These people were all enslaved once, and the people who owned Louis Vuitton were the slave masters. No, wait a minute, that's not right. Slavery is a long time ago. None of these people were slaves, and Louis Vuitton is like a French company that I don't think owned the slaves ever. But it doesn't matter, it's reparations, because they don't care who it comes from as long as they're rich. They don't care who gets it as long as they're poor and black. Black Lives Matter is the worst of the worst. And this is why I don't think anybody, even people who support the idea or anti-police brutality, anti-police racism when it occurs, I don't think you should ever march under the banner of Black Lives Matter. Yes, they're racists. On top of the fact that they are egalitarian nihilists. One of the arguments made, I've seen this all over Twitter and at Black Lives Matter, is what's the big deal? All these companies have insurance. So the insurance company pays for it. It's their job to pay for stuff like this. What's the big deal? I mean, again, the, 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 the ignorance, the stupidity. Well, I mean, insurance rates in Chicago are going up. Yeah, if you smash enough windows, insurance companies are not going to insure businesses in Chicago. If they will, they're going to charge you a lot of money for it. Which means some businesses, some of them might happen to be owned by minorities or by women or by, you know, rich guys, I don't know, won't open in Chicago because they can't afford the insurance. People are not going to shop in Chicago. That's going to destroy business, it's going to destroy employment, it's going to destroy everything. But again, think about the world in which we live. Who the hell needs a job? Who needs employment? Why do you need employment? The government can just write, it can print $3.7 trillion. And that's under a Republican. If it was a Democrat, we'd be at $6.7 trillion. And they just print it and they hand us checks. And if they can hand us, and, and we had a leading candidate and a bunch of people who supported him who thinks UBI is a good idea. We'll just print money and give it to people. Who the hell needs to work? Let's go smash stores because we don't need work anyway. Why do we need shops? Who do you think pays the taxes that makes it possible to pay you? Insurance companies, stores. Who provides the capital? Well, insurance companies by buying stuff that, by buying bonds that then fund the building of factories where some of you might work.
where do you think all this stuff that you own, whatever it is, even if you're poor, comes from? Where does your job come from? Or if you're on welfare, where does the welfare check come from? It comes from the few people in this country who are still productive. And if you destroy their ability to produce, you will get poorer, not richer. Poorer. Again, please, Paul, Kugrin, explain this to them. But no, we get the opposite. We get bogus economics, bogus view. Property rights, who cares, they say. There's insurance. Insurance isn't property. And without property rights, there is no civilization. Once we abandon property rights, we abandon all civilization. Forget about welfare. Forget about UBI. Forget about redistribution, reparations. Because there is nobody to take it from. Because without property, we're all dirt poor. We're all scrambling for the scraps. We're all fighting each other for what's left. Without property rights, there is anarchy. The really, really ugly kind of anarchy. It's the only kind of anarchy. But for those of you who still believe in anarchy, the really, really ugly one. That's all there will be left. That's all the, that is the world that you are leading us towards. And I include here the rioters in the streets, the BLM and the people who demonstrate with them, and the intellectuals who give them cover. And the intellectuals who give them cover, if there was a real hell like Dante, Dante the author envisions it, and he had different rungs of hell, and the more sinful you were, the deeper in hell you would be, closer to the fire burning the most. Well, that lowest rung, that lowest rung, the rung where you suffer the most, that rung is dedicated to the intellectuals. That rung is dedicated to the Noam Chomsky's and the Paul Krugman's and the George Stiglitz's and the, you know, the thousands of them at the universities. Of course, that's where, you know, the German romantics are. That's where Marx is. That's where all these people are. And they burn. If there was hell, that's how I'd structure it. Burn. <sighs> it turns out, <laughs> shockingly, I mean, I was shocked by this, surprised. And it was just completely unexpected. It turns out that when the looting happened in Chicago a few months ago, people were arrested. Lots of people were arrested. It turns out that none of them were charged. It turns out that the city made the decision not to charge people who looted during the George Floyd riots, demonstrations. Well, because they sympathized with them. The city officials sympathized with the looters. And, you know, it was passion and excitement. And they got, things got out of hand. And so they let them go. They let him go without charging him. Didn't send him to jail. <laughs> what do you think would happen? So you basically are telling looters, we're not going to charge you. You can go steal from Louis Vuitton. Go steal your Mac from the Mac store. Go steal all this property. And we're not going to charge you even if we catch you. We're not going to really try to catch you. We're going to tell the police to lay low. But then we're not even going to charge you. And the mayor today, the mayor Monday yesterday said, oh, no, no, no. Look, there is no connection, she said. There's no connection between the fact that we decided not to prosecute the looters and the looting that happened yesterday. No connection. These people, I don't know how stupid you have to be, to be to either believe your own lies or to believe we will believe your lies. Because that is one of those whopper lies that hopefully nobody believes. And I don't think they believe it when they say it. It's so unbelievably 
nuts. All right, so yesterday, Monday, they didn't want another occurrence of looting. So usually what you'd think a police force would do is, is they would go, city officials would put SWAT teams on the street, police in full gear, ready for the looters, you know, and, and maybe warn them, you know, we might shoot you guys. We will protect property in the city of Chicago. That's what we are. We are the police. We're tough. Don't mess with us. You would think, think that's what they would do. But no. I mean, yes, they had some SWAT teams out. They had police in, you know, relatively high numbers out in the streets. <laughs> but what they actually did, you know, I don't know how many of you have been to Chicago. Again, a beautiful city. It has a river that goes through the city that separates the south side, uh, south part of downtown and the north part of downtown. The Miracle Mile is in the north part of downtown. And what they did is all the bridges on the river are drawbridges so they can, they can open up. They opened all the drawbridges so that you couldn't drive from one part to the other part. You could probably get there if you went around, but they figured it's too much work for people. So they put all the drawbridges up. Now just think of that. I mean, I'm looking at a photo of the river and all the drawbridges raised. It's like we're waving the flag of defeat. We're like, we've given up. We've given up. We're not going to fight you. We're just going to make it hard for you to get there. And by the way, at the same time, we are going to shut down the city because nobody can drive from the north to the south. And these are busy roads. These are constantly cars traveling here. No, we're going to shut it down. Nobody gets to go anywhere. Bridges are up. You can't loot. <laughs> I mean, this is the city officials in Chicago. This is what they think is an answer to looting. We're all the drawbridges up. Hey, by the way, if you haven't noticed, we're surrendering. We've given up. All clear. And, and we're going to shut down all life in Chicago. So that a few hundred people don't loot our luxury stores. Instead of going and fighting. And we're going to allow BLM to demonstrate. And we're going to shut the city down. Oh, and talk about shutting the city down. BLM, of course, is not done. They want those hundred people released, and there's systemic racism in America, and, and there's just massive injustice going on, and they need to continue demonstrating, and particularly in the city of Chicago, uh, they haven't demonstrated enough, and they need to show the, the, the commitment to demonstrating, and it, so they sat down with city officials, and they planned a demonstration for Saturday. So Saturday in Chicago. They don't just want any demonstration. BLM is ambitious after all. So they want a demonstration that basically shuts down the highway. Shuts down the highway. And the city said, I mean, you'd expect the city of Chicago, it's a major city. The highway is super busy. It's a massive uh, place where trucks are going back and forth. Uh, huge, uh, you know, tra uh, important location. So what do you think the city said? Fine, we'll shut the highway down for you. And indeed, on Saturday, the highway is going to be shut down so the BLM can demonstrate they're shutting down the city of Chicago in a different way, this time the highway. To hell with you if you want to travel somewhere. To hell with you if you're a small business owner who's got a truck who's trying to deliver goods. Tough. Don't do it on Saturday. And, and don't do it by trying to cross a drawbridge because they're all up because we can't, have, we can't have people commuting, traveling. That's bad. Um, it turns out it's against federal law to block a highway. The law is against this. Highways are federal property because these are interstates. Doesn't matter. Nobody's going to stop the demonstration on the highway. You're not going to see federal troops protecting the highway. It's not going to happen. Um, truckers, a truckers union, 
small truck, small truckers, a union of small trucking companies, are suing the federal government, suing the federal government, because their livelihood is at stake, and they rely on these highways. So now we're not looting. You won't see smashed windows. You won't see looting, looters rushing into stores and taking Louis Vuitton stuff out of the store and sticking it in their car. But they'll still be looting. They'll still be destroying private property. They'll still be destroying people's livelihoods. The people who want to drive on Saturday through that highway will be prohibited from doing it. Why? Because BLM wants to demonstrate. We really need to rethink this whole demonstration thing in America. We really need to think the demonstration thing in America. It's gotten completely out of hand. It is indeed insanity. You cannot have a right to demonstrate if you're blocking the highway. You cannot have a right to demonstrate if you're disrupting people's lives. You cannot have a right to demonstrate if you're destroying property. BLM should be banned for demonstrating in Chicago. Everybody indeed should be banned from demonstrating in Chicago if they block highways, block streets, and incite or defend rioting. The Constitution, the right to assembly was not meant that you can assemble at somebody else's expense. You want to assemble? You know, rent a stadium and assemble there. You want to you wanna demonstrate? You know, take one of the baseball fields that they're not playing there right now and have a demonstration there. You want to demonstrate? Stand in front of a government property. Government, sorry, government building. But don't block the street. If you're blocking the street, we shut you down. You don't, can't even assemble on a sidewalk. Not if you're blocking people from engaging in their day-to-day -day business. You have no right to violate other people's rights. You have no right to make it impossible for other people to do their business. And yet we in this country, demonstrations, it's like, it's like free speech, but it's not. It's not. So I don't know what to tell you, but it looks like Chicago will be the first major American city in this round to crumble, to disintegrate. Now, I, I will give you this. If, if Biden gets elected, he will bail out cities like Chicago and states like Illinois. I don't think it can last very long because I, I think they'll run out of money very quickly. Uh, I, I think the economy is going to be a disaster if they actually live up to their promises in terms of stimulus packages. But Chicago, for all intents and purposes, finished. If you live there, move. And New York, somebody says New York is not far behind. I think that's right. New York is not far behind. And, and if you think about the coronavirus, and you think about all the businesses that have been shut down, the attitudes in big city about corona and shutting everything down, the reliance on uh, public transportation, the need to be in crowded elevators. Who the hell needs all of that? Why do you need that? You know, you can move to Austin, Texas, or to Dallas. Or to, uh, Houston's a little too humid and hot. But um, Florida, I mean, there are plenty of places, Tennessee, there are plenty of places around the country where you can live comfortable, amazing lives w without the kind of risk that living in a major city entails. Political risk, risk of riots, risk of property destroyed, but also risk of disease, which we are now acutely aware of. And of course, risk of politicians who at the first sign of disease shut everything down. Who the hell wants to live in a city that can be just shut down? By the way, we, we, we're almost up to 250 watching live on YouTube. 
141 likes, so it would be great if you got that number up, closer to 200, so if you're up there, please uh, like. Um, taking Super Chats, I think you know, I've, I've said this many times, the higher the Super Chat amount, the higher the dollar amount, the, the higher priority you will get on me answering your question. I've got a couple of $20 um, Super Chat questions here that I'll get to in a little bit, uh, but um, let's see if we can get some, some, uh, some bigger dollar amounts on the Super Chat, and I will take your question whenever. And of course, uh, you know, fifty, a hundred dollars above that, I'll definitely answer your question pretty quickly. Uh, beyond that, don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to support the show at youronbookshow.com/support. Now, where's the police in all of this? And this will bring me to the Seattle story. Well, the police are basically being shut down in most of America's cities. They've been told not to act too aggressively not to use tear gas, not to use rubber bullets, not to use the kind of means that you would use in order to you know, disperse a riot. They have to be really careful in, if they do need to engage with violence in order to get a suspect. There are all kinds of rules on what they can and cannot do. They haven't received the kind of training that would allow them to control pacifying a violent aggressor. I, I did a whole show about the need to better train police in self-defense, in pacifying an, 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 an assailant. And for the most part, police are doing what they can under very, very limited conditions, in a sense with two hands tied behind their back, to try to catch the crooks and then they get them in jail and then the politicians release them. Remember, in Chicago, none of the people who were arrested for rioting were prosecuted. They were all let go. So why, how does anybody be a, how, how, do you, how do you survive as a policeman? How do you do your job? You're hated and despised by almost everybody. People spit in your face. You can't really defend yourself. Whether you're a, you could be the best cop in the world. You could be paint with the brush of the worst cop in the world. You know, bad apples exist, and, and maybe there are too many of them in police, and I wouldn't be surprised because I don't know if the screening's tough enough, and I, as I said, I don't think they get enough training. But a few bad apples, a few bad people, Taint everything that you do. You fight, you try to arrest the bad guys, and then the politicians let them loose. Or the politicians justify what they do. And you, you are the bad guy. And then maybe during one of these demonstrations, one of your police precincts gets taken over because a politician told the police to abandon it. And you want to go in there and retake the precinct and establish the rule of law in the neighborhood. And you're told by the politicians that you can't. That there's a six-block area in your city as a policeman that you're not allowed to patrol. You're not allowed to go into. You're not allowed to disrupt. There's an experiment in communal living going on, as if we don't know how experiments like that end. And you just have to watch as a six-block area of your city just deteriorates into mayhem. People get shot. People get killed. And you, who's your job to protect, can't do a thing because the politicians will restrain you and won't let you do it. Of course, this is what happened in Seattle, where they announced CHAZ, the autonomous area. And this CHAZ, autonomous area, took over a whole police precinct. And when violence erupted, police were not allowed to go in. And they were not allowed to retake the precinct. And the police chief, Karen Best, a woman, a black woman, kept saying, we need to retake this place. We, we, we need to establish the rule of law. This is my job. I'm a chief of police. 
And she was told repeatedly by the mayor and by the city council of Seattle, no, 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 step back, step down. No, 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 we're going to let this run. Summer of love, we're going to try this out. This is an experiment. Don't intervene. Don't do your job. And you could tell in interview after interview and interview with Chief Karen Best how frustrated she was. She wasn't allowed to do what she's trained to do. She wasn't allowed to do what she knew was right, was just to do. She had to step aside and wasn't allowed to do anything. And then when Chaz turned out to be exactly what she predicted, mayhem, violence, and everything, finally she was allowed to go back. Okay. She went back. Then, in the last week or so, behind her back, one of the most leftist city councils in America devised a new plan to defund the police. Not to completely shut it down, but just defund it, which means shrink its budget. So they negotiated without ever letting her know and you budget for the police that shrunk it. I don't have the exact number, but uh, yeah, you know, they, they cut, I don't know, $4 million out of a budget of $170 million, including, by the way, cutting her salary by over $100,000. And they came to her with that as a fait accompli, as done. She would have to cut 32 fewer patrol officers. She would have less money for recruitment, training, and specialized department. Without ever telling her this was coming, with an air of superiority, the first black female police chief, or first black ever, in Seattle's history, was told, we don't really care what you think. 30 years she's worked in the police force there. And this morning she resigned. She resigned in protest of the budget cuts. She resigned in protest for the fact that they never let her do her job. She resigned in protest for the insanity and the hostility of the city council towards the police. Now, more than that, since the, the Chaz fiasco, demonstrators have been demonstrating outside her home every single day, harassing her family, harassing her for doing her job. Did the city council offer to support her, to provide protection, to try to talk to the demonstrators, to move them away? To No. Instead, they cut her salary. They cut her budget. They wouldn't let her do a job. In other words, this brave, and I don't know her that well, but every time I saw her on TV, I, I was impressed. This brave woman who has served as a police officer for 30 years, who's trying to do the best that she could in a horrible situation, was stabbed multiple times in the back by the city council members of the city she was working for. I, I just, I mean, ugh, the injustice of it is just so horrific. And this is happening all over the country. Police, police chiefs, being fired, retiring, resigning, having their arms tied behind their backs, being condemned, being ridiculed, being attacked. Now, again, there are big problems in the police. But this is not how you deal with them. Now, I hope, I know, I know we shouldn't really engage in hope. Hope is hopeless. Hope is putting feelings above reality. But, you know, I hope, I hope that the city of Seattle, the voters of the city of Seattle come to their senses. That they vote the city council out, just like I hope the Minnesota in Minneapolis, the Minneapolis City Council gets voted out. That they're all fired. That this mayor is kicked out. Now, of course, the funny thing is that people running 
to replace these city council members and these mayors are typically even further to the left than now. But I think you have two options in places like Chicago, Minneapolis, Seattle, and I love Seattle. It's a beautiful, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Vote these bastard outs or get out of that city. These cities are going to become crumbling down. Their economies are going to be devastated. They are ruled by the worst types of mindless egalitarian nihilists. Little power lusters. And if you stay, you will suffer the consequences. And unfortunately, our whole country is, is going to suffer the consequences. Because the cities go, the country's gone. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the role of the collectivist brute. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. It, all it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at youronbrookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs>